The last page has been turned on my most recent read and I'm on the hot chocolate because while it's sunny, it's also quite chilly and I need something that gives me a cozy feeling because winter is really not my season despite being a winter baby. It's been a bit of a week, so while I planned to record and release this episode last week, the delay was somewhat necessary, but I promised some spookiness for Booktober and I am hopefully delivering. I searched through my bookcase for something that had a bit of everything and discovered a few gems, some of which I hadn't even cracked the spine on. I have a great collection of novels with vampire and werewolf characters and somewhere probably hidden underneath something else there are a few tales of mummies, fairies and zombies but I have to be honest and say they aren't my favourites. I have always been a bit of a purist when it comes to the fantasy monster genre, vampires and werewolves are it. Yes, I know that there are loads more to choose from, and sure, 1999's The Mummy is awesome. I've watched it many times, but I don't think that they can really make for the best hero in a novel, especially if we're talking romantic novel. Right now, I'm ready to tell you all about the book I've just finished, so here I am, no spoilers, opinion-filled, and ready to roll, all of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. I'm your host, Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. We're now in the final days of Booktober. In fact, if you listen to this on release day, it is the final day. And I am looking to a very different werewolf retelling with a book that came out 13 years ago. Said book has also been on my bookcase since that point, unread. Yes, I do leave books for that long sometimes. So join me as I wander down the wooded streets of Mercy Falls, Minnesota, a small town where the wolves aren't exactly completely natural, and we meet Grace and Sam, two very special residents. Shiva is the first in a YA series, The Wolves of Mercy Falls, by author Maggie Steve Fater. I have the sequel, Linger, but the third, Forever, wasn't actually available when these were my impulse buys at the local bookshop. So light a few candles or perhaps just switch on that reading lamp because a bit of atmosphere is always a wonderful accompaniment to a reading session and to be fair with the skies as dark as they are you might need it. Get yourself a fresh cup of something hot or a glass of something chilled depending entirely on when you're listening and let's get started. For years Grace has watched the wolves in the woods behind her house. One yellow-eyed wolf Her wolf is a chilling presence she can't seem to live without. Meanwhile, Sam has lived two lives. In winter, the frozen woods, the protection of the pack and the silent company of a fearless girl. In summer, a few precious months of being human until the cold makes him shift back again. Now Grace meets a yellow-eyed boy whose familiarity takes her breath away. It's her wolf. It has to be. But as winter nears, Sam must fight to stay human or risk losing himself and Grace forever. The whole of the book is told through the eyes of the two central characters, Grace Brisbane and Sam Roth. When she was a child, Grace was pulled from a swing in a local park and dragged into the woods where she was bitten and mauled by a pack of wolves with unusual eyes. Her life was saved by something or someone she can barely remember, but she knows that whatever happened, she was rescued from it, Soon after, she became incredibly sick because her father locked her in a car on a hot summer day. Lesson here, people. Do not lock pets or people in a car when it's hot. It's really dangerous and you should know that and so should he have done. Ever since that moment, Grace has been fascinated by the wolves that live in the woods near her home despite the fact that they almost killed her and one in particular, a wolf with yellow eyes, is almost an obsession for her. Years go by, 
the wolf continues to visit her garden and there's an attack and Jack, a boy from her class, is killed brutally, his body found mauled. The entire town is up in arms and his father, a wealthy and influential man, encourages them to cull the wolves in their area, get rid of these violent creatures who have killed his son. Despite having almost been a victim of the same fate as a young girl, Grace can only think of her wolf, the one with the yellow eyes, and she does everything she can to prevent the hunt from taking place. It's then she discovers the secret, that these wolves are supernatural. A boy with yellow eyes turns up on her doorstep, bleeding profusely from a gunshot. The wolf with the yellow eyes is also a boy. I repeat, the wolf with the yellow eyes is also a boy, and his name is Sam. He hates what he is, would love nothing more than to regain his humanity. Sam has been visiting Grace in his wolf form since the day he saved her life. But he is also confused because she should be just like him. She was bitten. She should also be a wolf. But she isn't. Slowly but surely, Sam eases his way into every moment of Grace's life as though he's always been there. She was already infatuated with his wolf form, his eyes fascinated her, and she felt he was her silent protector. But now he has a voice and at night they share her bed, curled up close together as though this is the way it's always been. So, where are her parents, I hear you ask? Though there are elements of this book that are incredibly original, the missing parent trope is very much on active duty. Grace's parents are busy, they appear in the book, but they are disinterested in her life, despite the fact that they nearly lost her when she was little. They go about their own lives and she is the one that seemingly holds everything together for them. She is the person who makes their family meals, the one who ensures that everything is done in the house, the one who makes sure they are aware of what is going on in her life, despite the fact that they don't seem to give a toss at any point in the story. Grace's mum is an an artist. She has a studio in the house they live in, but she is more often out of the house at galleries, at shows, and her daughter is the last thing she is thinking of as she flits about with paint on her arms. Her dad is clearly the big breadwinner with an important job that means he's barely home, but when he is, he seems uninterested in whatever it is his daughter is getting up to. Reading about the strange relationship that Grace has with her parents, it's understandable that she often feels as though they have abandoned her and wouldn't care where she was or what time she gets home, or who she's with for that matter. Understandably, with such a secret to keep about Sam and the other wolves in the woods, Grace starts to distance herself from her two friends, Olive and Rachel, though she does attempt to confide in Olive only to get rebuffed. But it seems there's something going on in Olive's life and she is doing her best to push her friends away at the same time. Olive has a secret that is going to get very messy not too far in the future. All the while, Grace and Sam are trying to find a way to help him not change back into the creature he hates. Grace's own myth is growing. It seems that she is an anomaly. When she was bitten all those years ago, she should have turned into a wolf but something prevented it. And the wolves who have seen her have realised that she could be the key to their cure. But how to get it? And what is it? What is her secret? This realisation by the wolf pack puts her in incredible danger because they will get the cure however they can. It's the path of of a desperate person. There is another secret in the woods now. Jack, the young boy mauled by wolves and left for dead. Well, his body has gone missing. It seems that once infected with lycanthropy, his body took time to heal. But once it had, he was ready to go and find his own kind. Or not. But he is very much alive and after Grace, because she doesn't turn into a wolf, and he wants to know why. Grace and Sam are in a race against the clock. Because while Sam isn't sharing with her the fact that he believes this time will be the last, he will be able to turn human, she senses that there is something wrong and she is desperate to help him find a cure so they can be together. Sam is an interesting character and up until now I have been focusing mostly on Grace because for some reason I think of her as the main protagonist despite the fact that the book actually has chapters told from Sam's perspective too. At 18, he's a little older than Grace, but because of the fact that half of his life is spent as a wolf, his view is incredibly different. 
He is shocked that her parents show no interest in her life, but relieved because it means that he is able to sleep with a roof over his head and the sneaking around isn't quite as necessary. His life is very different and has been since he was bitten as a young boy when getting on the school bus. The weird thing is that though he is mourning the fact he is no longer fully human, he doesn't appear to be sad for the life he lost. But when you discover the truth about his parents, it's kind of easy to understand why. They tried to bleed the demon out of him in a bath of warm water by actually cutting his wrists and let him, letting him bleed. The mental trauma that this must have done, it's clear to see that he's not all about going back to see his loving family at any time in the near or distant future. And who could blame him? Sam trusts very few people, but he always sensed he could trust Grace, which is likely why he has spent the time since he rescued her from the wolf attack watching and doing his best to get close to her so she could see him as a boy, a man, someone to be with. I would say, oh, isn't his obsession cute? But it's also just a little weird and perhaps creepy. However, Grace's obsession with her yellow-eyed wolf removes some of that creepiness in some way, maybe. It's only when Jack's sister, Isabel, traumatised not only by the loss of her brother, but also by the discovery that he isn't dead because she's seen him, comes to ask Grace for help because she's the weird wolf girl in town after all, that you realise there is a lot more at stake than just Sam's ability to change. With an entire wolf pack of the mind that Grace is the cure, thanks to Jack telling them that she was bitten and didn't change, they need to hurry. Isabel, despite her initial reluctance, has an idea. But does she have the confidence to pull it off? As I've already mentioned, this book is one that has been on my bookcase for over a decade. And in all that time, I'd looked at it, but not felt like picking it up. I'm not actually sure why that was the case, but it never leapt out at me screaming, read me. Of course, we're not in Hogwarts Library. To be quite honest, I don't know why I bought the books in the first place. Nothing about them said, you'll love this, go on. Sure, the covers are pretty, but that's about it. Anyway, before I get into what I thought of this book myself, you know that I like to make sure the view I present is balanced because I think that getting opinions from both ends of the spectrum is important. No two people will review a book or look at it in the same way, especially when the material I'm looking at is so similar to other far more popular books. So what did other reviewers think of Shiver by Maggie Stiefvater? Tatiana gave the book a two-star review, and it's easy to see why. To sum it up, this book should have been called Twilight Team Jacob version. Why? Well, while I understand that the author wrote her first draft of Shiver before Twilight came out, still the similarities are striking. A boring girl whose only personality traits are obsessing about her supernatural boyfriend, doing homework and cooking dinner for her parents, check. An emo supernatural boyfriend whose life revolves around his human flame, who plays an instrument and writes songs for his girl. Check. A boy and a girl sleeping in the same bed night after night, and no matter how much this girl asks for it, the hero says no because it's not right. Check. Parents who are oblivious to the fact that their daughter practically has a live-in boyfriend. Check. I can go on, but I'm sure you get the picture. Why two stars and not less then? Well, the writing is not bad. It's a little purplish, but at least we are spared numerous chagrins and endless Edward ha is a beautiful godlike creature rants. I have to note here, however, that although the writing and author's vocabulary are much better than Stephanie Mayer's, this book lacks that signature Twilight addictive quality. I can't believe I just wrote this because I'm not even a Twilight fan. The middle of the book is especially slow moving. The werewolf mythology, although very little explored, is based on a moderately novel idea of the transformation caused by changes in temperature. 
And finally, the main scorer is that Steve Farta manages to create her book in an atmosphere of coldness. You literally feel cold reading this book all the time. I have to give her some credit for this. I'm sure it takes skill. Overall, it is an okay romance paranormal story. Emphasis on romance here. I expect if you love Twilight, you'll like this book too. I personally didn't care for it much. There are two more books in this series, but I doubt I'll be reading them. I can see exactly where Tatiana is coming from, which leads me to believe that there will be two types of review for this book. Those who loved Twilight and were Team Jacob all the way. Therefore, they'll enjoy seeing the werewolf win the girl, even though there isn't a vampire in sight, sparkly or otherwise. And there will be the girls like Tatiana who just couldn't get with the vampire werewolf program or perhaps have had enough of the forbidden cross-species love story. Ron Yell gave the book five stars, but admits that she would have loved to give it more if she could. Darn that scoring system on Goodreads. Oh man, I really wanted to give this book six stars instead of five because this book is just so brilliantly written and full of romance that make any romance fan go head over heels with this book. But I guess I will settle with a five star rating for now. Shiver is the first book in Maggie Steve Varta's Mercy Falls series and this book has enough action and love making scenes that will have you all breathless with anticipation. Grace had spent her time watching the various wolves that come out of the woods after she was bitten by a wolf a few years ago. However, when one of the students at her school goes missing, the townspeople suspect that the wolves have something to do with it, and they all tried to go out and kill the wolves. But Grace will not let that happen, since she cares so much for the wolves. And after she manages to stop the hunting, she meets an injured wolf and realises that the injured wolf was a teenage boy named Sam. And once Grace discovers Sam's secret, she tries to do everything in her power to help Sam stay human while sorting out her feelings for him. Wow, and double wow, Maggie Steve Varder has created a true masterpiece that is all about true werewolf love. When I read this book, it constantly reminds me of Stephanie Mayer's famous Twilight series, except that we see hot werewolf guys in this book instead of hot vampires, which I found to be incredibly enjoyable to read about. There were many aspects that I loved about this book, and one of those is that I really loved how each of the chapters was set up to detail the situation from two different points of view, who were Grace and Sam, which means that each chapter will either have Sam or Grace narrating the story from their point of view, which I thought made this book extremely interesting and creative to look at. Another aspect that I loved about the book was the characters, especially Sam and Grace. I loved the fact that Grace is shown to be an independent and enthusiastic teenage girl who was willing to put her life on the line in order to save Sam, the love of her life. And although there were times when I knew more about Sam's side of the story rather than Grace's, I still really enjoyed Grace's spirit throughout the book. Sam, on the other hand, may come off as being too sombre for his own good, but that is due to the fact that he wants to be human instead of a werewolf, and he is possibly the sweetest and hottest werewolf character to ever grace the world of paranormal romance. What I really loved about the book was that over 90% of it was spent in Sam and Grace's romance with each other, as there are a bunch of sweet kisses and sensual hugging, though not in an R-rated way, that made this book somewhat cute yet sensual at the same time. For anyone who does not like language, there is a good deal of it in this book, although it's not really strong, but I think the language in this book would be better suited for young adults. All in all, Shiver is a truly awesome book for werewolf lovers everywhere, and also is a great book for paranormal romance fans who love action and hot werewolf love. Did I like Shiver? On first read, yes, I liked it. It was exactly the sort of book I needed to read having just finished the incest-filled Flowers in the Attic. It is the perfect contrasting book, a sweet-ish romance after a book that was so dark and gothic. However, as I write this, it's been a few weeks and I've had time to reflect and there are some things that really bugged me. I would say I'm not the target audience for this book, but at the same time, all books are written for everyone. There is no age warning on it. No, this is not written for older people on the cover. 
So it was written for me as much as it was written for the teenagers who likely picked it up eagerly on release day. The love story was indeed sweet, and I did find myself really rooting for Sam and Grace to get there happily ever after. They deserved it, and that's what they were both fighting for. But for me, there was something hugely wrong with the parents, all of the parents, not just Grace's. I know that there are a lot of parents out there who suck. Seriously, did you listen to my episode on Flowers in the Attic? Kareem Foxworth was twisted as anything, and she poisoned her own children to get money. Anyway, Grace's parents' disinterest in their daughter felt baffling to me until I remembered her father had locked her in a car as a young child on a hot day when he went shopping and she nearly died. So even before she started having nightly sleepovers with a boy, they didn't exactly look after her like interested parents. But for once, I do wish this wasn't a regularly used trope. It would have been nice to see parents who were at least minutely interested in their child in a good way. One thing I will say about Maggie Stiefvater's creation that's clever is the mythos she has created for her werewolves. There's no silver bullet or full moon here. It's all to do with the weather. The colder it gets, the more impossible it is for the werewolves to maintain their human form. So in Minnesota in the winter, the fact that Sam is by sheer force of will staying human is a testament to his feelings for Grace. The book deals with the whole, wouldn't it be better if they lived somewhere like Texas or Florida question quite well, highlighting that the warmer the region, the more sensitive they become to sudden changes in temperature. And I love that Steve Barter actually considered that would be a question her readers would have, so ensured that there was an answer at the ready. The mythology is great. The fact that it appears she thought of everything is great. But the story itself just felt too much like it was written to make money off the popular plots of the moment. Grace was a cliché. She was Bella the outcast, though she had lived in the town all her life. And the fact that we were somewhere that the we where the weather was always grim, cold, miserable, reminded me greatly of Forks. I'm not saying this plot was ripped right from the pages of Twilight, but it feels incredibly similar. At least there were no sparkling vampires to be found in the woods, though. Will I read more of the Wolves of Mercy Falls series? I do have the second book and there are only three. And when I finished the first one, I really wanted to pick up the second to find out what happens next, as it did end on something of a cliffhanger. But the more reviews I read, the less I want to. Am I saying that I will be led by negative reviews? No, not on your Nelly. But I am going to put some time between Shiver and the sequel, which is called Linger, because I would like to judge it for myself rather than be influenced by what I have read from other reviewers. The book was well written and there were moments when I was pulled deep into the story being told. But at the same time, I think that these books are better read a few months apart so I don't suffer from a YA angsty werewolf overload. If you're looking for something like this or you loved this and want to read something else, then these might be a good option. This is an interesting one. I would say if you like the whole werewolf thing, then the obvious first books are actually the Unfinished Night World series by LJ Smith. Yes, I know I've recommended them a few times in other situations. They are YA through and through, and you get the full spectrum, psychics, witches, werewolves, vampires, and mortals, all in one nine-book set. Ignore the fact that the series is meant to be ten books and therefore unfinished. That doesn't really matter, because each of the books can be read as a standalone. My favourite, admittedly, is Daughters of Darkness, the story of Ash and Mary Lynette, which is actually vampire and human. The obvious next option has to be Twilight. I admittedly devoured them when they first came out, though more because I was a Team Jacob. I didn't want her to end up with the 116-year-old sparkly vampire. My spike-loving heart simply couldn't bear the thought that a vampire sparkled like he'd been doused with glitter in the sunlight. Despite my multiple cringe moments while reading this series, if you like your werewolf tales, this has to be somewhere on your list if it hasn't already appeared there before. 
If you want something a little more adult in nature, then a great place to visit is Toronto for Bitten, the first in the Otherworld series by Kelly Armstrong, a fantastic series that follows the world's only female werewolf, Eleanor, as she struggles to fit in after being turned, fighting against her true nature and the man who loves her, Clay. It's been another interesting week, though also one filled with relief, as I had some fantastic news which I will go into later. I have been very disciplined, sort of, when it comes to my book buying habit, in that until Saturday I had managed to stay away from acquiring any new reading material that I wasn't sent for a book tour. However, yesterday I had a bit of a book haul when I visited a few of the many charity shops. There are nine on one road near me. I ended up bringing home seven new books. Six were in a new to me cozy mystery series that I'm looking forward to trying out. And the seventh was a book I read and loved years ago, A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan. It's been years since I read it, so I'm looking forward to getting my teeth into it again. It's very different to the books I've been reading recently, so it will be a pleasant change. I have managed to read a few books over the last couple of weeks as well, which means my annual count is now up to 109, which is more than 100% on top of my original target. 50 of those reads have come from new authors I had never read before, which I think is a pretty good batting average. Last year, my target for new authors was 20, and I have smashed that one out of the park in 2022. Though I have been incredibly disciplined when it comes to my book purchases for the last few weeks, I have still been getting recommendations, and my TBR wishlist pile keeps on growing. Christmas is coming up after all and people are already asking me what I want. I still want to hear from you if you have suggestions. So if there is a fiction novel you think I would love, recommend away. Send me an email at notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I will be sure to take a look. This week we're heading into November releases, which means many of the books will be ones you might gift to the reader in your life or put on your own wish list. So let's take a look at some of the books coming out in the week starting on Halloween, the 31st of October. If you're a massive fan of the tennis ace Roger Federer, who retired this year, then maybe this book, The Roger Federer Effect, about his life, his relationships and his tennis, is something to put on your Christmas list. It's a great looking coffee table book by Simon Cambers and Simon Graff. Ever wanted to find out what books inspired your favourite contemporary authors? If so, then What Writers Read by Pandora Sykes could be just the book for you. Bono's an activist, a father, a husband, a singer, and now he's a writer with the release of his biography, Surrender, 40 Songs, One Story. Extracts have been appearing in the papers for the last couple of weeks, but now is the time for you to read the whole story. Friends, Lovers and The Big Terrible Thing by Matthew Perry comes out this week. If you love Stephanie Plum, then head out now to pre-order the 29th in the series by Janet Ivanovich. Going Rogue, Rise and Shine 29, nice rhyme. A long time member of the team has gone missing. Where? If you love Dark Place and Garth Marenghi, then this latest book will be one you want to get your hands on, Garth Marenghi's Terror Tome. Even the cover looks creepy, and with a subtitle like Curl Up With This Book and Die, you know it's going to be different. I haven't talked about all the books coming out, but if you want to find out more about new releases in the next few months, make sure to sign up for my newsletter by clicking the button on my website or heading to my Twitter page. I know that I have been a bit lax with those of late. I will go into that in a bit, but I am in the process of getting things sorted out so they will be out every weekend. 
Also, have you checked out the new section on my website? I have started to do a spoiler-free book review you can read in less than three minutes in my new section, Rapid Reviews. You can find it on beingbookish.co.uk. So how are things in the bookish household this week? It's definitely been a week. (laughs) That's something I can say. I have been, for the last few weeks, in fact, for the last month and a half, I have been in a, I'd say a relatively dark space. I've been struggling to sleep, yet I've been absolutely exhausted. I have been having nightmares when I do sleep and I can put it all down to one thing. I found a lump. And yeah, I'm not going to go into this in incredible detail because you don't need to know. But as anyone will tell you, when you find something that makes you feel different or you discover something or you just feel wrong, your brain, especially when you suffer from depression, goes into absolute overdrive and panic and that is where I have been for the last six weeks as I waited for a hospital appointment to see a specialist after I'd been referred by my GP. My brain was all over the place. I was struggling to focus. It's made things very difficult with work because it's been incredibly busy and my concentration has been out the window. So This week, I had finally my appointment. They are supposed to have, in the UK, there is a two-week referral system for suspected cancers. That's two weeks. I waited five weeks because my local NHS was running behind schedule. It's not their fault. They have been playing catch-up for a very long time. But it doesn't make the person who realizes that they are going to be stuck waiting to find out whatever's going on for far longer than they should. So my brain was in a very bad place, which meant that I was doing everything I could to distract myself. I was reading a lot more. I was reading comfort books. And last week... I my hospital appointment was actually Thursday just gone so a few days ago and I got the all clear and I've never been so relieved in my life because for the entire five weeks running up to it I have been panicking like nothing on earth and sorry if you heard that my cat has just jumped onto my desk because she's decided that this is the spot that she wants to sit in. But it's okay, I have company. I have been nervous, anxious, stressed, all of the things that you really don't want to be at any point in your life. And I've had all of them for the last five weeks. But as I said, on Thursday, I got the all clear I had a load of tests done, they poked and prodded, I came home bruised, but I also came home safe and secure in the knowledge that I am actually okay. And unfortunately, what I discovered was part of (laughs) getting older as a woman. So yay, if you're a woman, you've got this to look forward to. (laughs) But as I said, now I can carry on safe and secure in the knowledge that everything is okay and hopefully that will now lead to better nights of sleep. Unfortunately, I did have a bit of a panic attack cycle on Friday night which led to a lot of stress on Saturday morning but it also led to an entire day of sleeping so these things happen. All in all, though, things are much better than they were. And I can look forward to the next five weeks, knowing that we're coming up to Christmas moments and be safe. So my message here is if you do find something and you're anxious about it, 
talk with someone, speak with your doctor, get a referral and hopefully your results will be exactly like mine. To change the subject completely, next month I'm going to be doing an entire series of book to movie adaptations, including novels by Dan Brown, Susan Collins, Neil Gaiman and Stephen King. So join me for those. You'll have a fantastic time. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please Post a star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of the other podcatchers where you listen. You can follow me at on Twitter at being underscore bookish and on Instagram at being bookish pod, where you can see my current reads, finished reads, and my book hauls. Or you can check out my website, beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've got a lot to get ready for next week and a new book is calling me. So until next time, this is me saying farewell. Farewell.